I think we can start with the, the last panel of uh, this particular uh, dialogue. And uh, uh, today for this uh, last uh, panel on the youth migration in future work, we have uh, two panelists. Uh, on uh, my uh, right is Ms. Maria Pietro. Uh, Maria Pietro is uh, an employment of the future and work specialist in ILO's employment policy department. Uh, her current work uh, focuses mainly on issues related to ongoing and future challenges in the world of work and youth employment. Maria has more than 17 years of professional experience in the United Nations, ILO, and UNDP in positions that include thematic areas such as youth employment, local economic and social development, public-private partnership for urban environment, small and micro enterprises, informal economy and infrastructure development. Maria holds a degree on the Master of Science in Business Administration and Economics from the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. All correct? All correct. Thank you. Uh, from my left, uh, we have uh, uh, Ms. Joanna uh, Nipierala. Did I pronounce well? Good. Uh, Joanna is a policy analyst in the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, where she was recently co-edited uh, the GRC flagship report, The Changing Nature of Work and Skills in the Digital Age. Digital age. She holds PhD in economics from the uh, Faculty of Economic, uh, Economic Science of the University of Warsaw. Her research interests include migration of Poles in two Scandinavian countries, migration of women, influence of social networks, uh, existence on the labor market functioning. Thank you for uh, having a time to be with us today. Uh, similarly to the previous uh, panels, we have a certain number of questions that you should ask. And maybe it will be different than other sessions. We have two panelists. I will probably list the all three and give you the floor that you can actually speak on uh, as, as uh, in one block because I think we'll be better better presents and then after we can give the floor for the questions. Do you agree for this or you want one to one? How, one yeah, question? Sure. Okay. Uh, Ms. Pietro, uh, the first one is globalization has led more diverse work opportunities for youth seeking to enter the labor market that brings more opportunities, more challenges at the same time. What are ILO's strategic and approaches on how to better equip and empower youth to respond to those opportunities and challenges? This is the first one. Are you going to list them all or you want to go one by one? That's we'll go one by one. Okay, let's then go, please. Uh, okay, so let me, okay, uh, good afternoon by the way. Um, so just let me put things into a little bit of perspective by throwing out a few statistics just to... Um, so there are 145 million youth working in poverty, 145 million. So. And 64 million are unemployed. So basically there is an issue here of not employment, of unemployment, but one of access to a good job. And there is 164 million migrant workers in the world and 12 million youth migrant in the world. Um, so, and so that there is an issue of poverty and there is an issue of youth uh, access to good jobs. So this is in this context that we are sitting here today. And from the ILO, the ILO, uh, the International Labour Organization, is a tripartite organization that has a board that includes governments, employers, and workers' organizations. Our mandate is um, social, social justice for all, very ambitious, and our agenda is the decent work agenda. So that's uh, where we come from, where the organization comes from. And as such, the ILO adheres to the SDGs. Um, Gold 8 is uh, the home, if you like, of, of our SDG, that is full employment and decent work. Yeah, but we also adhere to other frameworks like the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, etc. So, and we are also a normative 
organization and standard setting organization. We work with international labor standards, conventions and recommendations as one part of our work. And uh, in the area of um, youth, there is a, a, a resolution that is called the Youth Employment Crisis, a call for action that obviously also include youth migrants, yeah? And more recently, what the ILO has been sort of investing a lot of time on is to create a framework to address the changes in the labor market that are occurring, yeah? And I'm sure that you have seen in social media, in, uh, in newspapers, etc., cetera, um, the discussions around the future of work. Uh, and how it is changing and how work will change, etc. So the ILO launched um, an initiative called the Future of Work Initiative to explore what was going on around the world in all our 187 member states. Uh, and in parallel created a commission of experts and uh, sort of high-level experts um, chaired by the Prime Minister of Sweden and the President of South Africa. And in these discussions of the Global Commission on the Future of Work, um, the, the final outcome is a, a publication called Work for a Brighter Future. And the essence of that publication is um, the suggestion of, well, there are 10 recommendations, but the suggestion for the application of a human-centered agenda. And, which is, you know, I highlight this uh, as a very important part of, of, of the ILO's framework at the moment. And at the same time, because this was a global commission, to make it part of the ILO and to spread it to our member states. Uh, this summer, in June, in our International Labour Conference, uh, there was the adaptation of, a of the so-called centenary uh, declaration on the future of work, because the ILO just turned 100 years, and sort of this was sort of with a bang, if you like, going towards the future. And this declaration also highlights the so-called human-centered ap approach. And what it means is that in all these changes that are going on in the labor market, the human being is put in the center, if you like. Um, and it contains like three parts. The first part is the strengthening of the capacities of the individual, no? Um, looking at gender equality, looking at uh, how to implement uh, um, a strategy that will permit skills development. And the recommendation is, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, is an approach to lifelong learning that would permit people to upskill and reskill following the demands of the labor market, that I'm sure we will come back to. Um, Social protection is another angle, and uh, the issue of transitions, because for past generations, our gen my generation, my parents, etc., the issue was to having one, two, three, four, up to five jobs in a lifetime, whereas what is sure now is that that will not longer be the case. Uh, whereas we had maybe in a couple of years we had one job or two jobs, etc. Our children will probably have sent ten jobs in one day if they work in the through the gig economy. So the the structure of the labor market is completely different. Yeah. So this needs policies and and, and programs and support. To, for people to go from school to work, to, to another job, from, to another job, to care, to another job, to retirement, etc., sort of facilitating this new scenario of how we will work and produce. And the, for this, we need institutions of work, like, for example, uh, that respects the fundamental rights, 
that of all workers um, that have adequate wages and uh, limits times of work uh, and have safety and work uh, safety and um, and health at work but we will we also need economies that can create um, a sustainable environment for job creation you know, like macro policies that will permit this development and this is not only employment policies but financial policies and trade policies etc that uh, sort of collaborate in order to have employment uh, growth um, investments in infrastructure and uh, the development of sustainable enterprises to create jobs uh, are, and the transition and the facilitation of transiting from an informal economy to the formal economy um, and then lastly there is the issue of that was considered extremely uh, important the protection of the worker beyond all the, the protections we have today and that is the protection of the workers data um, that was put as a very important point so the impact uh, and is different though of all these issues is it different it differs from country to country from region to region from locality to locality so there is no one size fit all so it has to take into consideration the situation in the in the locality thank you then it will go to one question then to you and then we continue further discussion then the the question that I, we have for for Joanna is uh, you're one of the co-authors of a report analyzing relation between digital age and the nature of work and I think this is what already touched a little bit with the number of jobs that in future we have in the same day uh, could you please highlight some of the key findings of your research for this report and how those findings relate to the youth in mobility Hi. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, uh, as you said, so I, I was quoting a report on the changing nature of work. That's uh, how the report looks like. You can uh, download it on the website. Um, uh, GRC is uh, one of the European Commission institutions, and our job is to um, uh, collect information from the research uh, from many, many different uh, institutions and uh, summarize it and uh, tell the story to poli policy makers uh, to make their decision better. Uh, so, um, and uh, another uh, um, bunch of activities that we do at the uh, Joint Research Center, um, uh, we try to anticipate the future. Uh, and what we do, we do a lot of activities uh, that are called uh, foresight. Uh, and you can find on our website, uh, we identified uh, 14 megatrends that are going on uh, right now and shape uh, the situation of, uh, of human beings in the globe. And one of them is, uh, is labor market. Uh, and this report specifically uh, is dedicated to summarize uh, all the changes that, we, that are going to happen uh, in the next years and then we can expect it uh, uh, will change our life. Uh, and we've probably uh, heard and read, I'm sure that uh, all of you uh, read at least one article about that the robots will take our job. And it's just a matter of time. It will happen next day or in a week of time or in 10 years. Um, and our first chapter summarizes discussion and summarizes all the research that was done in that area. Uh, and what we learned uh, from the discussion and debate is that um, uh, we need to think uh, that there, are, there won't be any task that, will, uh, that don't, don't have the potential to be automatized by robots and take by robots. It's just a matter of time. And um, it's across skills, so no worker is safe anymore. Uh, it's in, not about only low skill level workers, it's also about high, highly skilled uh, uh, workers. But what we um, discovered also in that debate is that uh, um, only tasks that are repetitive, only tasks that are predictable uh, and don't include any uh, social interactions are the most uh, prone to be automatized in the nearest future. Um, so if you think about that, then uh, you can use OECD tool, which is uh, also available online, uh, and try to answer a few questions about your work, uh, and then you will discover like 
how your work is prone to be automa uh, to automation uh, in the future. Uh, of course, there is an uh, element of uh, personal choice. Like, if you think about uh, caring work, uh, that is um, uh, work that is done mainly or to uh, much extent by my mi migrants. Um, like, um, if you will age uh, and if you will be older, then uh, of course you will require more and more uh, care. Uh, and it's uh, Europe is aging, and uh, we are. F um, in the long term, we are thinking like how to uh, make sure that all our citizens will have uh, access to the healthcare and, uh, and to care uh, services. Um, and of course, we uh, we could find and um, uh, fund a lot of innovations in that area and try to uh, robotize this area. But do we really want to have uh, robots to take our hands when we will be old and uh, care for us? Uh, we will probably not, and uh, that's the area that uh, shows that even if we will have a technology to replace uh, human work, there will still be um, humans needed uh, uh, to perform that work. Um, um, and that uh, answers like uh, how this automation uh, could impact migration uh, flows and migration patterns. Um, but another link to migration uh, we can make via technology change is of course the platformization of work and the gig economy that Maria mentioned already. Uh, we noticed that uh, technology allowed a lot of our work to be done via online, meaning that um, probably most of you used uh, Uber drivers or uh, used Uber Eats to um, have your food delivered uh, to your home. Um, there are certain services that could be uh, performed anywhere in the, in the world uh, and um, in the match between employer and employees done by the, by the uh, online platform. And if, if, if you think about this, lab, uh, this market, uh, you could see that most of the jobs um, that are done via the platform work. Um, the demand is coming from uh, developed countries like Europe, uh, United States, Canada, but a bunch of this work is done actually in India or Asian countries. So like 70% of the work that is uh, demanded via from uh, Western European or um, developed countries is actually done by, by people uh, in less developed countries, which means that if the platform didn't exist, then the people should, like, they, they would migrate otherwise. That, that's, uh, um, so um, we did two surveys uh, on platform workers to, uh, to see um, if this phenomenon is increasing or decreasing. And we, of course, uh, uh, we see more and more engagement in platform work uh, of young, but not only young uh, workers in Europe. Um, and what is uh, really important to say is that this work, um, those contracts, well, it, it's not about contracts, but um, um, these workers are really vulnerable because they don't have social protection. The, the contracts they have between them and cli clients, uh, most of the time um, they are in a shadow economy, so to speak. They are, they don't, they are not protected by, by um, any um, uh, any social protection. Um, uh, and also, uh, if you see uh, workers that are involved in platform work in Europe, they also uh, like one third is um, uh, it's about young workers. The positive side of platform work is that uh, young people can actually gain first experience via them. So um, some people are saying that this phenomenon actually allows young people to enter the labor market and gain the first experience. But looking from the social pr protection perspective, we see that uh, those contracts are not really a contract we would like to young people to have. Uh, so um, uh, that's probably like the two main uh, topics of interest uh, for the labor for the migration and. Uh, technology change. Thank you, Anna. Uh, now we have another two questions for Maria. And those two questions are, what is the interplay between the youth mobility and changing nature of work, as well as the digitalization, integration, and globalization of, of the labor markets? How will all those uh, contemporary developments impact youth uh, and its mobility? This is the first one. And the second one, what tools can be used by the international community, for instance, in the area of skills, facilitated mobility and effective job matching, bilateral, multilateral cooperation, labor mobility, 
to cover youth potential and labor mobility and to contribute to the development of origin and destination communities. The long ones. Okay. I keep putting here. <laughs> All right. Let me address the first one uh, that relates to uh, the drivers of change that are influencing the labor market and the interaction of those drivers of change with young people and migrant, young slash migrants. And the one, the first uh, message that I would like to leave you with is that there are several uh, drivers of change and they should not be seen separately because it will give just part of the answer what technology, how technology influences the future of work, how the shifts in demographics or how you know, climate change. You have to look at the whole spectrum of things to be able to say, to make an accurate analysis. That's the first message. Um, and now looking into the different drivers like globalization is one that we often just overlook because it's been with us for a while, decades. But there is a shift in globalization, whereas opening up tr of trade and, and, and the traveling and uh, a free movement of goods and people, etc., was a trend that was expanding due to recent uh, geopolitical approaches, uh, there is a setback in globalization, there is a, a stagnation, there is a return to nationalism and protectionism as a trend. And this is important to highlight. And this also influences obviously migration and migration policies and programs. Um, at the same time, as globalization also has been increasing in terms of through internet, through new technologies, uh, like uh, we are extremely connected now. We know exactly what's going on in Madagascar and in two seconds, etc. So that brings us all closer together. But there is a, a turn, if you wish, in, in, in desires, in how people see um, like getting closer to each other, yeah? And it, it, a lot of the answers lie on what have been seen as losers and, and winners of globalization, and a lot of feelings around that, yeah? Um, another driver that every, it's every, in everybody's mind and it has been mentioned already is the demographic shifts. And there is now, globally, we are aging. I mean, the whole world is aging, which is a good thing. It means that we have better health care and we take care of each other better, etc. Um, at the same time, that it cannot be forgotten that Africa has an enormous youth bulk. And this constellation brings certain um, tendencies. If you think, you know, you, we have an aging population, say, in Japan, and next door you have uh, not enough jobs for youth, meaning in the, then it would be normal that there would be a matching, yeah? Um, and there is a tendency through the care economy uh, of increasing uh, employment through that sector. And migrants and young migrants are, have a tendency to, or have, yeah, in, particularly in Asia, Asia, but in other countries, to be in that sector. So there is that influence uh, no, on the aging. Now, technology that we have been already uh, touching upon uh, is the other driver, the, the most popular driver of change, if you like. Um, and it's one that generates a lot of fear. Will I lose my job? Will my job we be uh, relevant in a few years? Uh, and there are a lot of studies. A few years ago when we started the whole thing, the, the issue was jobs will be destroyed, point. And now with time, 
uh, it has changed. Um, there was an issue of low skill jobs that will be destroyed, but then it's not completely accurate because uh, there are also high skill jobs that are destroyed. So, but one thing is for certain though, and that is that all jobs will change in a way, and they have already. I mean, if you think about it, we work differently than we did five, ten years ago because of all the gadgets that we have access to, because of you know, things like the internet on the emails and the, uh, the, a and the apps that we use. Uh, I know in the ILO we have several apps just to do training. Uh, so that's, um, so it will change. And in, in terms of automation, another discovery, if you like, is that there is a direct correlation between age and risk for automation that we have done research on. And there is a U curve, sort of the younger you are, the higher the risk for automation, and then the curve goes down a little bit with age, and then it goes up again when you go up in age. So that's another sort of uh, finding that we have. And Automation is, in principle, displacing. You know? the, the question is how, and the, the issue is that automation and technology is happening in such a speed that what is true today might not be true tomorrow. We just need to take this into consideration. Um, like, but automation is there, like the, the International Federation of Robot, Robotics has confirmed that there is a high concentration, an increasing concentration of robots being created and disseminated to developed economies, yeah, mainly. Uh, and that influences, obviously, the, the migrant workers that had these jobs uh, earlier. Uh, and um, the same goes for digital uh, digitalization. Uh, there is a high concentration of access to digitalization or to the internet in developed economies. It's, I know that there is this whole feeling that Africa is connected and the, uh, the apps, etc. But figures don't lie. There is a, a, a huge gap. Uh, with the developed economies. And the, and the last uh, driver that I wanted to mention is environment and climate change that is influencing us a lot, the way we work and produce. Um, rising sea levels, uh, heat stress is um, like the, the latest uh, issue that uh, the people are not able to work in agriculture in certain parts of the world anymore because of heat stress that causes enormous uh, strains. And that influences obviously also migration from in or, uh, countries of origin and destination. Um, so um, this is, has to be seen also in, in a world where developed economies and developing economies work very differently, whereas developed economies have formal economies normally, and you do studies and, and on, on automation, etc. Developing economies are to a high percentage working in informality and makes it very difficult to make that kind of estimation. The ILO has been working on the informal economy for decades. And we don't see any diminishing of the informal economy in, developed, in developing economies, on the contrary. And now there is a new kid on the block called the gig economy that is not helping things because we see uh, an increase in non-standard form of, of employment in emerging and, and developed economies as well. Um, uh, for the <laughs> I go you. for the second question on the tools as well. Mm. Okay, so there was another uh, question uh, uh, on tools and how the organization works uh, around these issues. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, you have as a UN organization, we work in the framework of the SDGs, obviously. Uh, and as a normative organization, we have conventions that we. 
uh, advocate our member states to ratify, basically. And those are conventions that go from the most fundamental rights, uh, freedom of association, um, abolition of forced labor, things like that, to more sort of um, employment uh, creating, uh, if you have one on, on migrant workers, we have, well, I think we have something like 200 and so on. The latest uh, convention that we uh, adopted this year was on uh, violence and harassment at work. So it's basically the improvement of working conditions in the labor market and then migrants obviously play a very important role there. Um, my, my colleague was telling me earlier that yes, uh, migrants are very much in that violence and, and harassment convention named as well. So the, the ILO works through its normative framework but has also a technical cooperation arm that is quite strong and that deals with migrant issues uh, through our migrant uh, branch. Um, like um, it has a fair and recruitment initiative uh, that deals with issues of um, recruitment practices and uh, prevent human trafficking and reduce the cost of labor or uh, migration. We also have youth employment programs and our partners in many in many um, uh, initiatives around the world to foster youth employment and to improve the, the conditions of work of youth and of migrants alike. Um, so, and so the, the main thing that a migrant, I was listening to the previous, uh, the previous uh, discussion on, on the mental health issue of, of migrant, I think they must be refugees, not migrants. We do separate them in the ILO, you have refugees and you have migrants, but I don't know if, if that's not the case here. In any case, um, it is very, uh, the, the ILO sees as uh, very important to secure the, f the future of this, uh, of the migrant as well. And social protection and social security are paramount in this endeavor. People that come to a country to work need to be made in, integrated into the economy. Uh, so we do um, sort of support agreements between host countries and countries of uh, destination, bilateral agreements to in increase social security and social protection, but also multilateral agreements. And those are those are extremely important normally to, uh, if, if we are able to create them, because nowadays globalization seems to be happening at a regional level in the EU, in like pockets, whereas, you know, ILO and the UN as international organizations, we would like to extend rights, uh, etc., to uh, uh, the global community as such. And to talk about skills, although I think my colleague here must be my better place uh, to do that, I want to repeat the issue of lifelong learning and the, um, the use of technologies to make it happen. Now, obviously, you're probably thinking, how do you implement lifelong learning in, in such and least developed countries? Uh, and in others like Singapore, it's already a fact. These are aspirational goals. This is what the ILO recommends in the long term, to reskill and upskill and to follow the person throughout his or her life uh, and to facilitate skills, uh, rec skills recognitions from the country that they were from origin to, the, to the, the next country and to the next because Many migrants don't just stay in one country, they go to several countries and it's an important thing to have, to recognize those skills that are coming with the person, yeah? And obviously then uh, I want to uh, stop with saying that the ILO sees as the most important skills, or 
many, all skills are important, but uh, there are three types of skills that are now very high in demand. One is obviously digital, and the other one is sort of more technical, non-digital, but soft skills, as and I think it was mentioned previously, it's also extremely important. And the collaboration between then the educational system and the labor market sort of not only thinking at education as one and job as one, but as a continuum of the two. So I will stop there and I would just want to encourage you to, to go to our page, our page and, and see further information on these issues. And we have plenty of tools like on recruitment, uh, on migrant workers, on uh, recognitions on prior skills, etc. that can be very useful in, in your work. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, now we have another two questions for uh, Joanna. Uh, how can young people on the move better prepare themselves for a labor market consistently evolving due to technological innovations? This is the first one. And the second one, what are your recommendations for the government's education system to ensure youth enter the labor market with diverse and recognized skills? I think something that you can just continue what we just listened from Maria, please. Yes, that's true. Uh, I completely agree that uh, we are going to expect more jobs to be created. So technology uh, change doesn't mean that uh, we will experience a uh, destruction of, uh, of the employment. So that's not what we see uh, right now. And uh, if you think about uh, some jobs, actually, uh, they didn't exist 10 years ago. So, um, and for that reason, it's actually uh, very difficult to foresee what skills people will need and advise. Um, uh, young people to acquire those skills. But um, looking at the historical data in Europe, uh, we see that more and more, um, if you compare jobs that um, were present at the labor market like 10 years ago and uh, jobs that are present right now, we see that uh, more and more digital skills will be required. Of course, um, knowing that our jobs uh, will require tasks to be performed together with robots, it means that we need to learn how to communicate with robots, we need to communicate also with other colleagues. So. Uh, we also uh, recommend to um, look at the area of uh, education of non-cognitive skills. Uh, and by non-cognitive skills, I think that definition is, uh, could be quite um, difficult to, uh, to understand, but um, because non-cognitive skills that I will refer to, they still require cognition to, to be used. Uh, and by non-cognitive skills, I mean um, a skill of communicating, a skill um, of team working, a skill to... Um, um, uh, be more resilient, be more adaptive to change. Uh, and that's uh, being adaptive to change is actually something that uh, would be really required, as uh, Maria said, uh, uh, the speed of change is will, uh, will be really like, um, uh, not uh, it wasn't really observed so far on the labor market. So we will need, really need to be very, very adaptive to the changes on the labor market and changes that our employers will require from us. Um, and to be resilient for that, we need to uh, have those, uh, those skills. And I think it's, it would be especially important for, uh, for young uh, people. Um, but also, as I said, more and more people work via those uh, platform, uh, platforms like Uber. Uh, and it's part, uh, they are part of this gig uh, economy. Um, and by getting involved in those activities, they need to be more entrepreneurial. Um, so um, we developed a framework uh, called Entrecomp, which is uh, already used by many, many uh, education institutions uh, to identify areas um, where um, teachers can work with their students and develop uh, those entrepreneurial skills uh, further. Um, and we think uh, about being entrepreneur not only um, as a person who is establishing uh, a, a business, it's more about acting uh, upon opportunities and uh, being creative uh, so it's not only like a uh, very economic um, establishment, uh, it's about more generating social, economic and cultural values. Um, so being more uh, active also in the daily life. Um, I'm not sure if I could make any recommendations because um, my, um, by representing GRC, I, I, I'm not in a place to make any recommendations, but uh, we look in certain areas uh, re relating to the education systems. Um, and when we see that uh, whenever education systems are more involved uh, uh, in, the, in the cooperation with governments, in cooperation with uh, local institutions and employers, uh, those types of activities really uh, are very fruitful to uh, improve um, 
um, chances of young people to enter the labor market more smoothly. Um, also, we promote the lifelong learning approach. Uh, and um, why, why we are um, promoting it, the reason is uh, obvious. Like uh, technology, we interrupt and we'll keep interrupting our work. So we uh, will have to reskill and upskill uh, constantly. And uh, we will have to learn um, not only during the formal education, uh, but uh, also um, once we will uh, enter the labor market and, um, and, and start, uh, to start to work. Um, and we identified that uh, online uh, courses could be really helpful in this uh, lifelong learning approach, meaning that uh, uh, there are so many uh, courses available online that uh, are accessible from, from any place in the world, which is networked. Uh, uh, so it's really accessible and uh, could be very uh, efficient in uh, provi um, providing of new skills. Um, so I think uh, those, two, uh, those things that I can mention and those, those points we can make to, uh, to this topic. Thank you a lot to both for a brilliant presentation from both from the ILO perspective, but not only ILO perspective, basically where the future work is and also supported by the research done by uh, IS, IS, IRC, GIRC, yes. sorry. What is, can you tell us full name? To uh, take it? Because uh, this is what yeah, I, I think. It's Joint Research Center. Yeah. Just not to, because there's too many abbreviations, I think it's better to say the full that nobody can actually make a mistake and come to the, your website. Now I would like to invite you for a questions, uh, comments, or uh, anything to uh, anybody from the floor. Yes, I cannot see the name, but I, I see. Please. Mauritania, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm just wondering about the concept of uh, uh, migration and refugee. Have you ever find yourself that you cannot, uh, you cannot know if this is a refugee's case or a migration or any mixed uh, case like that? Thank you very much. Um, well, I think it's more a question for the, my colleague here <laughs> next to me, the IOM. Um, but uh, the recent issue of, uh, I mean, the ILO says everybody has the same rights, basically. It's social justice for all. It doesn't say social justice for nationals. No, for all. So as such, there is no difference. Uh, but there, is a, 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 there are legal questions behind that my or my people in transits, etc., that um, would need different approaches maybe. Uh, I have personally never encountered uh, something that was unclear, but uh, I don't know if IOM wants to say anything. This is the why actually I'm and UNHCR are actually working together on the field and as is probably all of you are aware, we have the number of uh, consultative processes all around the world with I'm and UNHCR are working hand to hand. And in that sense, UNHCR is working within their mandate and this is on refugee status de determination and yes, they are also beside uh, being guardian on the 51, con uh, 51 convention, they are also uh, working with the stateless and this is mandate of UNHCR. And then when you come to the migrants, then it's you coming uh, towards Siam. And this is basically the two things uh, when uh, uh, we come to the simple kind of explanation. You're absolutely correct when you're coming to the person that is crossing the border. You, in many aspects, you don't know actually who is standing in front of you. And this is why our two agencies often together with the support of the civil sector working together on uh, profiling each individual case and seeing how to proceed, proceed further because status for this mention is very important one but we have a two things one is the legal status and one is actually how the someone perceived him or herself we have another comment from Nepal or question please uh, first of all I would like to thank IOM for organizing this important uh, dialogue uh, I commend all panelists for their wonderful presentations and sharing views on this important topic. This topic, in my opinion, is highly relevant in the face of challenges and complexities 
of globalizations. I just wanted to share my thoughts in these connections. Firstly, human-centered approach in every sector of the world should be at the core for addressing the techno-induced labor market. Secondly, lifelong learning for all, increasing investment in people's capabilities and increasing investment in decent and sustainable work are most for dealing with the future world of war, where youth migrations also could secure their place. Thirdly, new forces are transforming the world of war. Technological advancement is going to create new environment for war. And many jobs are going to extinct due to technology. So we need to educate, empower, and effectively engage youth to face up upcoming world of work. In this regard, findings of ILO report titled Work for a Brighter Future, prepared by global commissions on future of war, are very important to cope up with the future challenges of decent and sustainable work. Thank you. Thank you to the distinct villain from Nepal. Do we have any other comments, questions, quick comments or questions? No. Uh, then actually we can uh, proceed. I would like to thank you to, to the to panelists and uh, would like to invite uh, Ms. Jill Helke. Uh, she's the director of the ICP Department, the National Cooperation and Partnership Department in IM for uh, closing remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I don't want to keep you from catching your planes or your evening plans, but I would like to thank you all for staying to the end uh, and for all the participation that you have uh, been contributing throughout the two days and, of course, to all the panelists for their contributions. Uh, I think the discussion has been very rich the session was a follow-up to the previous International Dialogue on Migration in New York, a dialogue that has really begun the dive below the surface of the deep complexities of the relationship between youth and migration, and challenged us to discuss several more facets of this topic. I hope you will feel you understand better and perhaps have even been inspired by the presentations and will reflect on the knowledge and expertise shared by the speakers. As the DG mentioned in his opening remarks, IOM wants to listen, learn, and act on these discussions. We're committed to following up on various recommendations and good examples and build effective partnerships with the different actors who've been identified during the course of this dialogue. I can't do justice at all to what has come up during the course of these two days, but here are a few highlighted takeaways. Young people are not strategically important only because of the percentage in the world population, but also because of how much they can contribute. Empowering youth is an investment for creating foundations for stronger future generations. Youth have a key role to play in sustainable development, and this can be enhanced through ensuring their access to capacity building, knowledge, technology, and training. Technology is an important tool for young migrants, a tool that gives us a chance to produce verifiable data through the combination of apps, social media, and one window approach. It's essential that verifiable data can be analyzed without bureaucracy. Partnering with local authorities and private sector is key for this to become more possible. Unheard stories. Successful migrant voices are needed, but we also need to listen to the ones who did not succeed, the ones who didn't make it through migration but returned home, and what happened to them. Young diaspora contribute to their countries of origin, transit, and destination, economically through remittances, through the transfer of knowledge and skills, by connecting people and resources, but also through the movement of cultures which helps to break negative and harmful stereotypes. 
We need comprehensive solutions for the engagement of diaspora, which should include policy changes such as on the right to vote and the right to nationality, and appropriate programs for integration and exchange of experiences between diaspora and their countries of origin. It's necessary to build capacity for better collection of data and statistics, to assess the needs and potential contributions of diaspora populations, to establish the right means of communication with them, and to provide an enabling environment for them to be properly engaged. In the African context, we need to start building a new narrative and perception of African migration. There's a need for a more nuanced and fact-based debate on the migration flows, and we think the African Migration Report will be an important tool in this regard. One of the conclusions of the report, which deserves attention, is that while women constitute almost half of the total migrating within Africa, women mostly stay relatively close to home, whereas it is the men who travel furthest afield. Education is a powerful tool for youth integration. Programs like Tandem, which bring local and newcomers together in universities, should be replicated in other areas, aiming at providing better support and integration to young migrants. Environmental changes affect everyone, but some groups are affected disproportionately, including youth. Youth has to be given a role in disaster risk reduction, has to be included in policy discussions and processes, having the chance of meaningful participation. As highlighted by our speakers, youth are already making a difference in building resilience and making strong calls to be heard. We need to be better at identifying the fears that disable young migrants and reduce the mental stress for them, including through more support and faster administrative processes. We need to look at work in the big picture, the conditions of work for young people as a whole, and taking into account technology and demographic trends and have a lifelong learning approach. The recommendations made by speakers over these two days and participants over these two days have demonstrated that young migrants have unique needs that can only be addressed through the active participation and cooperation of all relevant stakeholders. In the coming days, a longer summary of the dialogue will be made available and a comprehensive report of this dialogue and the previous one in New York will be released. I would like to thank once again all speakers and participants for the thoughtful contributions to this session. We hope this provided an opportunity to reflect on the complexities of youth migration and will have emboldened you to take action to address the needs of young migrants in your respective countries, communities, and spheres of influence. As we begin preparations for the IDM in 2020, we would welcome your feedback and suggestions on themes to explore, and we look forward to seeing you at future IDMs. In closing, I would like to invite you to give our panelists and yourselves a round of applause, and I wish you safe return. Thank you. I would also like to thank uh, the organizing team from IOM who put all this together and kept it going, and I'd like to thank the interpreters for also staying the course. Thank you. <laughs>